Hello and welcome to this special edition of Agenda. The 21st of July marks the 40th anniversary of man landing on the moon. Most Australians know the role that the Parks dish played in bringing some of those pictures back to Earth. But what isn't as well known is the role that this dish outside of Canberra played in capturing the very first images of Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. Today on Agenda, I speak to two of the men that were at that tracking station, Honeysuckle Creek, just outside of Canberra back in 1969, to share their memories of just how it all happened. I'm going to step off the land now. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. John Saxon, Hamish Lindsay, thanks for your time. You were both involved with the NASA space program in 1969, back on that fateful day in July 1969. Can we start by getting you both to explain what your roles were, what you did during that day and as Neil Armstrong took the first steps on the moon? Well, I was uh, what they call an operations supervisor. I uh, sat on the main operations console for the Honeysuckle Creek Station. And I guess part of our job, uh, Hamish will probably agree, it was a bit like conductor of a band. We had to look ahead to see what was coming up, make sure everybody was ready for that type of thing, and a lot of other jobs as well. So uh, on the ops console, that was me. And Hamish? Uh, I was the other end of the station, what we call the front end, which was the antenna and the receivers. And uh, my particular job was looking after the controlling computer that control the angle of the antenna where it, where it was looking towards the spacecraft and the information that was being sent back to Houston and, and the, or America generally, uh, there was two places, Goddard and Houston, where the antenna was looking. I was also responsible for the time standard which all the clocks in the station ran off this particular time standard which was a cesium beam, very accurate time standard. And also the ranging system which measured the distance to the spacecraft. Right. Plus I was also the technical support section supervisor, which did a lot of other jobs. You, you, you described Apollo 11 as being a simulation, but without any hiccups. Explain what you meant by that. Well, the simulations were designed to uh, really ring us out, to, to stress the people way beyond what would normally, hopefully, happen during a mission. Uh, there were two, the station was divided into two groups of people, the simulators and the simulatees. I hadn't thought of it that way before, but um, the simulators went around doing very nasty things indeed to the people who were trying to do their job. Every position had an observer from NASA who used to watch, and if there was a door open in the cabinet, they were in trouble. Uh, if, if they did anything wrong, they were in trouble, and they would make a, a key person go sick, and he had to have medical attention. And in my particular case, I was standing there, and they came along and said, that component has failed, go and get a spare one out, came the stopwatch, and they timed how long it took to get a spare from the store. Well, we used to do very nasty things to people, like setting off fire alarms and having to carry people off on stretchers, and um, gen generally misbehaving around the equipment, pulling bits out of the equipment and all the rest of it. But you had to be careful because the next time around the situation was going to be reversed. You were going to be the simulator or the simulatee and so on. So, um, how important was it to get it right on the day, do you think? Was, was it all It was hugely necessary? important. It was the only way that we were so confident on, on the real missions that they were, we were not going to have all those problems. It was great. See, the, the, uh, all the procedures changed with every mission. And so what they used to do, they used to send an aircraft out with a simulation team on the ground. And we'd go through all the new procedures for each mission. Obviously, uh, things like um, stepping on the moon is quite different, just flying around the moon. And having a, uh, a, a lunar rover was completely different again. We nearly tore the station apart to cope with the, all the extra gear required for uh, Apollo 15. But all the procedures had to be checked out. And that, they used to grill us. To make, uh, they'd hold a message up to the last minute and watch the panic as we tried to get it through on time. Things like that. I don't think I can really tell him the story of the first simulation and the uh, post-simulation debrief by the NASA crew chief. <laughs> but he got the entire station down in the cafeteria. I, I remember this vividly. And the station director, everybody was relaxed. Station director was sitting cross-legged on top of the ice cream 
um, freezer and so on and so on. And in comes the simulation director and he says, you guys are a bunch of shit. <laughs> you can cut that bit out. Uh, I, we were absolutely flabbergasted because the Americans were always so polite. It was unbelievable how, how they would never say anything nasty, would they? Until those first simulations came along and boy, did we get told. It was quite uh, amazing. They wanted to test you. They, they, they really did wing us out and, and we didn't perform the first time around. But by the time we got to Apollo 8, we were well trained and... Well, a lot of the staff, were, re a lot of the staff were replaced because they weren't well, up to standard. That, 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 that yeah, and that's true. in the early days, very early days. That was true too. We won't say that. Though. Um, but it, 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 if it wasn't for those simulations, I, I, I can't believe that we would have been half as confident or competent as we were. I mean, when I listen to some of those tapes now, we were incredibly uh, laid back about all this and very confident that we, we had the capability, we could do it. And there were no Americans on the site. Prior, prior to Apollo, there'd been discussions about having Americans on the site and the Australians said, no, uh, you tell us what you want and we'll do it. Well, during Mercury and Gemini, a flight control team would come out from America and there would be an astronaut attached to it. And uh, they used to run the mission from the station on the ground. And in that particular case, it was near Perth and Carnarvon, north of Perth. They were the two prime stations for, uh, for, for those missions. And we used to have a flight control team came from America and ran the mission. And Houston would ask them, would you please ask him this or ask him that? Whereas when it came to Apollo, uh, there were no Americans on site. It was the first time that they had good enough ground communications to be able to centralise the mission control. Up until that time, they'd just been too unreliable, really. So, uh, yeah, it was... The simulations were... I'd, uh, I'd, I'd have all your listen listeners or viewers to go back and see what the technology of the time was, and they'll be quite amazed. But what do you mean by that? Well... We, we think nothing of a, we laugh at anything with 32K memory, but our big computers, which were as tall as a man and as wide, wide as two men, only had 32K. And we were thinking, wow, this is technology. So the biomedical condition of the astronauts, John Saxon explained to me what Neil Armstrong's heart rate was like when he landed, took his first steps on the moon. Well, we did have the capability to uh, record uh, the astronaut biomedical data, uh, amongst other things, their respiration and heartbeats. And um, Neil Armstrong, uh, when he stepped onto the moon, he was doing 112 beats per minute, which is very minor exercise for the most, most of us. But for Neil Armstrong to do 112 was uh, <laughs> quite exceptional when you consider that when he took off uh, from Cape Kennedy in the Saturn V rocket, which is the biggest rocket ever built, he was doing 84 beats a minute. I mean, I get up to 84 beats a minute going up the front steps. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to also remember that while all this was going on, we had our, what they call the wing station, which was Tibber Miller, the deep space station, had been attached to us so that it could tra uh, track the command module, which was going around all the time, and it had to be monitored all the time. And his conditions had to be uh, monitored too. And all that information was sent from Tibbermill across to us, and then we placed all that information with our own information and sent it over to his 